Hi guys, Sullivan here in Philadelphia. I am at the computer and that means that we are going to look at some of the roses and plants for the Rose Orchard project of 2024. But first we're going to go out to the greenhouse because some roses just arrived and then I'll show you a quick peek of the ones that have arrived over the last couple months that are in three and five gallon pots uh, in a semi-shaded bed. Let's go to the greenhouse and take a look at unboxing some roses, bought and paid for by me, but shipped by Heirloom Rose. I hope you guys like seeing how nine roses ship to um, across country. I think heirlooms in California or out west, but um, they've updated their packaging since the last time I ordered. I really like it. Um, less stabby when you're reaching into the box um, with thorns and things like that. You know, I wish there was a way to eliminate some of the plastic from this, but I do understand why. And one of the boxes was pretty badly dented and everything was still fine. So, all right, so now I'm going to take you guys into this program that has been in the background. Um, it is called Milanote. Again, something I use, I pay for, not sponsored, not affiliate, anything like that. But um, it's something that I started using uh, around the beginning of the year. Um, the flower pictures are covering some private personal stuff, um, other notes and things, but I found it to be an excellent way to organize. It's sort of like an evolution. I still have my spreadsheets and um, I, I don't think that that's going to go anywhere, but what I think this is going to replace is that I would frequently take items, uh, photos and the names and things from my Excel spreadsheets and put them into PowerPoint to make myself planting plans and things like that. And I think that's all gonna end up in here uh, because it works really effortlessly between drawing images, pulling images from the internet. It works with Excel, Google Docs type of formats. So it's all around been really great for organizing. And so um, I'm gonna take you into, well, first, since not all those roses that came up are for, um, the Rose Orchard project. I'll show you a couple. So there's three in this, um, three in that order that are being added to the berry bed. So I actually don't normally go for variegated roses, but I, um, last fall, last autumn, when I was putting things to bed, um, I pulled out this rose Dainty Best. Some people love it. Some people have really bad luck with it. I never got mine to grow particularly well. It remained a single cane that would give me two flowers a year. So I pulled that um, and uh, tossed it away. And I have blueberry and pinky berry tones and things in this bed with some salvias, penstemon, some evergreens, um, invincible, hydrangea, which is uh, the spirit too. So 
I thought that I would give these a try. I don't know that I will like them. Um, for example, on Googling, both of these, Purple Tiger and Varigata, not, um, not sure. A friend of mine has Easy on the Eyes or one of the other ones that's like bullseye with this marking. And they have a lot of potential, so those were in the box. But I mentioned using this in Milanote instead of PowerPoint. And these are things that are on order or have already arrived. So, um, and then I, you can see under here, I basically have every one of my gardens named and uh, I'm not gonna get into this because we're here to talk about the um, rose orchard. But anyway, so Milanote lets you create boards, projects, to-do lists. Here we are on our video series. So let's go into the main board and this is, it looks, it's, it, it looks boring. Um, and that's because I am a big believer in compartmentalizing. Like my, um, sometimes assistant laughs at how buried se things seem in my files, but it's very helpful for me to kind of have everything organized. So, um, although my, camera's cropped so you can't see the current chaos in my office. But um, so we have the rose list, the trees and shrubs, product shopping list, uh, and I can add to all of this. And then um, these two are inspiration boards. So I feel like we'll jump in today into the roses since uh, they're all shipping in the next month or so. And then we'll look at some rose garden inspiration and then I'll show you how I kind of look and pull more. So here we go, here's the roses. So today, stainless steel arrived, as did Lagerfeld. Um, and, and you can see, as I do with my kind of need for organization or how I organize floral palettes for clients, I, I organize, uh, things in similar color group things. Uh, the majority of these are either relocate, so you can you can even see that I have a note with what its name is, how many I'm getting. Um, this is one that I already have planted, where I need to relocate it from. Um, I'm trying to find all my Coco Locos. They were sort of eaten by some mountain mint. Um, some of these are Japanese varieties, which we'll probably do a separate video on those because those were some effort to track down and I, they're new, new vendors for me. Um, lots of these florist roses are coming from Grace Rose Farm. I have ordered as a florist roses from Grace before. Um, I know them to be, you know, they're garden roses, so they're less like florist quality, but they do grow really beautiful plants. So I, I, I kind of don't have any doubts that because they're shipping premium plants out, th these will probably be pretty good rose plants, but we'll see how they grow. You know, most of us are home gardeners. We're not growing under protected tunnels or, you know, in greenhouses and things. Um, but really, maybe you don't need me to... Uh, narrate this you can just look here i'll make it bigger and zoom in for you I forgot to add the caption. This one is called Lucifer. I'm gonna hope in um, Japan or China that name means something different. But anyway, there we are. So you can see there's some beige lavender to browns. Amnesia is one of my favorite florist roses. Uh, it's just a great in between lavender and brown. So I'm excited to possibly Get, you know, I, I say possibly because until you grow these plants, you don't really know what they're going to do for you. 
Um, Stephen Rulo and Connie Sandstorm, these are very long time wish list roses for me. Um, they were bred by a woman named Burling Leong, who has a company called Burlington Roses. And um, Grace Rose is distributing the roots, but Burling, um, I've bought plants from her as well. Um, she's a mail order with a shopping list kind of thing. So, um, you know, not every grower has to have the crazy fancy website. Um, Cafe Latte, uh, the brown roses, beige roses are all the rage in cut flowers right now. So there's a bunch of these. Um, uh, all of these are Japanese or Chinese labeled varieties that, like I said, were a little bit of digging. Um, yeah, moving some things around. Uh, my distant drums have always grown pretty well for me despite being moved around like 9,000 times But right now my golden cedar is like kind of beating up the top of a plant So the flowers have struggled. So some of these are just going into the rose Garden because I think they'll do better with a little more space uh, I don't think I've forgotten to add anything to this. So I think there's 33 images on this page and there are multiples of uh, about half, uh, there's about 10 or 12 varieties that were so expensive that I could only buy one of. And then there were a few that I was very excited about. So I bought threes. And then in some cases where I could, I would get twos. I don't really love twos of anything, but at least have a backup if one dies. Um, some of the Japanese varieties were very costly. So um, not quite tree peony level, but pretty expensive. Okay, so now you've seen what we're working with. Let's look at some rose garden inspiration, which was surprisingly hard to find. And um, only because I found that it was it was shots like this it's very like broad overview kind of things like there's not um you know I get that not everybody uses drones and things like that anymore um I thought this was really beautiful this like, kind of rose arbor walkway I don't see that for my rose garden um you know, some of these are catalog pictures or things. It, it's just a lot of Googling and, and trying different terms and looking through Rose Society blogs and things like that. We'll go looking for some more. But, you know, Rose Gardens, from my point of view, looking at this, um, you know, they feature roses. They tend to have some sort of uh, generally an evergreen or a box or, you know, some kind of low container hedge or grassy paths, things like this. I do love the way that, well, one, this isn't too many colors, like something like this feels a little busy to me, even though I know it's very formal. But you know, we've got the lavender as a contrast, the baby pink with the white, the peach, and then this bright magenta doesn't feel too discordant. Um, same for this very blurry picture. Uh, but it was oddly very kind of challenging. So what I like about Milanote too is that you can stack things easily on top of each other. I mean, here's here's a rose garden probably in California where they're just shrubs carved out into space. I'm sure from above there's some sort of layout here, but it's hard to see. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't love when people are in things, but because um, then that turns into like too aspirational. But, uh, you know, again, a calmer color story. And I think that because I like such unusual colors, it's somewhat, um, it, it's good for me to kind of think about the harmony as, as you look through them, because I am planning to plant them in kind of color segments. I am not mixing the colors together. So, uh, you know, I think, let's see. It's gotta be British. Uh, not a rose garden per se, but kind of like a gravel path, 
the brick lining uh, is probably not something I can do, but there is something about this like kind of bursting out over the paths that I enjoy. Though, you want to be careful with that with roses. I have a rose that I have to relocate in another bed that is so thorny that it has to go further back because it like snags me if I walk by and look at it wrong. Um, all my pants have rips on the sides from where rose thorns have got me. Um, you know, again, not my favorite colors, but I think this kind of gives you an idea of like creating the fields of color. Um, very, very formal, 2010. So, uh, terraced garden. Uh, why isn't this stretching? Okay, there we go. Yeah. Um, I like that they're like, they look like they're, they're, the plants are attending a show and they're going to be watching a, like a concert or something. They look like they're stadium seating style. Um, I'm sure the roses are very happy surrounded by all of that stone for some heat and we'll touch on some of that, um, things that you, I'm figuring out with other parts of my garden that allow me to create microclimates that make things bloom a little earlier or change things. I want to say this was an article and this kind of feel with um, obviously this is a lot of gravel because it's most rose gardens you're going to find are in California or hotter climates um, but there was something about this like uniform idea but you know, with rose standards and lots of pillar roses and things like that without having that kind of hedge that you typically see. I'm just, I, even though this is heading into a place that's a little more formal than I am used to designing in, I think that um, hedges are possibly a bridge too far for me. And look for rose garden layout. You know, I'm sure everyone knows, but Google, the robots are, are going to show you different things based on your search history, as creepy as all of that is. You know, this this is likely too too far for me. Oh, I can't I can't deal with things you have to click through. Very formal, very formal. I, I do like this kind of spilling over effect, but let me show you one really cool thing that Milanote, so Milanote has an, a browser extension that I put into Safari and I can just right click and save it to the Rose Garden board. Yeah, it's a lot of boxwoods. I'm not a huge fan of rose standards where they're groomed up into this tree form, but I could see again why people who have very formal rose gardens really. Yeah, this is something that like I love that, but, but I'm trying to do this without all the perennials because I have all of that going on elsewhere in the garden. So I'm just not sure if I'm going to feel like I'm missing that stuff. Roses are pretty leggy. Um, they're not known for being particularly beautiful at their lower half, but there are some tricks and things that I've been collecting over the years for growing roses more horizontally, kind of layering them together so that you can, you get more uh, horizontal space and it sends up more blooms usually. And I like the idea of kind of weaving these color palettes together. But uh, yeah, you know, you're going to find a lot of ideas about companion planting. Um, obviously, David Austin knows a whole lot about, um, let's stay in the UK site because we're not buying anything. Um, inspiration. Rose recipes. Oh, this is nice of them. You know, it's going to be a mixed border. Uh, purple and yellow, 
I'm really starting to, I've always said uh, that I don't love yellow and I don't love daffodil yellow. All right, so I've always said I don't love yellow, but the reality is I actually do. I like very specific types of yellow. I used um, a ton of forsythia on a hoopa for a wedding that I did for friends last week. And um, I like it en masse. I don't love forsythia with too many other cut flowers because I think the color becomes distracting. I find the same for yellow sunflowers and bright, bright yellow daffodils. Love how a lot of websites are now putting out these planting plans and planting guides um, because I think it's helpful for people who are renovating or beginning a new design to start thinking about drawing. And it, 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 you can do this on a computer now. It does not necessarily need to be hand sketched. What is, is this a blog? Oh, okay. This is a rose blog. Wow, that's quite a list. 61 varieties. And nice. Little small. So yeah, I think, I mean, you know, very much you're gonna find either uh, straight rows of roses, rows of roses, but, um, oh God, this is called the Wells Fargo. Um, distant drums. Yeah, they just, why are there not, people post more photos of your gardens. Not just on Instagram. It's pretty hard to search Instagram through the internet. RHS, always a good place to check out. Okay, here's great, perfect. A list of roses, or rose, RHS rose gardens. And then you can probably go to each of their websites. Oops. Excellent. So let's save this to the board. Portland, Oregon, a lot of roses as well. I mean, it looks like AI, it doesn't look real. It probably was at some point real roses, but the way that's put together, no. Okay, so this is a, a, a this is helpful for me. I kind of, I feel like I need to save this even though it's uh, very few colors because, because the plants in this garden are to be, so here's what it looks like when you save some things. It puts this unsorted column to the side. You put, drag them in. And then if you're like me and you like to keep things clean, you remove the captions and everything. I believe it still keeps somewhere. It keeps the hyperlink. But why this one is helpful for me is that um, Between the roses and the fruit trees that are the main plantings in this new space, it's gonna be very pest pressured. I've been referring to it as aphid central. I have no doubt because I've done very little pest treatment in the garden in the past that eventually predators will come in to help me with the aphid problem. But um, there are herbs and things that you can plant. And while I don't want, <laughs> in the process of currently uh, trying to contain out of control mountain mint everywhere. Um, I don't want to plant in ground. So my thought would be to incorporate things like lavender, mint, fennels, other things that are sort of um, herby deterrents for some of these pests and maybe do them in small pots. Um, what those pots look like, not sure, but Something that I can move around, doesn't have to be permanent, can change things out, don't have to worry about mint and things running out of control, and kind of using them around the border, at the base of the plants, essentially, to sort of camouflage those kind of sticks in the ground sort of thing. And um, 
and also potentially help with pests. So that's why I say I'm like concerned with it not having any perennials between it. So I still feel like I'm gonna be missing that and I'm gonna want to find uh, a lot of interest in herbs and annuals and things I can grow from seed that I can grow in pots to kind of style around the outer edges of these beds. So since we're doing inspiration, let's go and we'll look at some parterre. Again, very hard to find things. Um, simple. I like the color blocking. I'm, I'm not going to do brick, but the concept of parterre is uh, creating kind of compartments, uh, sometimes terraced, sometimes heavily divided. You must have to clip that every day to keep it looking like that. So, you know, this concept is ornamental, which in this case, very much so. It's beautiful. It's just not something I'm interested in, but I like the creativity of the shape here. So. I love my rusty edging and I actually have quite a bit left because I didn't use as much of it in my vegetable garden potager renovation or the greenhouse foundation so I have a bunch of this so it is going to make an appearance in edging these beds so this a little more stone than I have access to but um I like the three textures of, I, I, I would probably do my crushed gravel versus the lawn. And I guess I thought this was mulch, but now I'm looking at it, it's black lariope. Mondo grass. I don't need a stream, but I would love to figure out a way to put an unobtrusive water feature into this area. Uh, I think you'll see when we, I think the next video is going to be drawing some of this and showing you all the different ways I've tried to lay out this space. But I, I loved this, edged with grass right up to it and just this like little stream. Um, and it made me think about, you know, the faux ponds that everybody's doing and all the, the equipment that exists now to do these water features that look more natural. So. I still haven't found the place for it in the layout, but um, you know, maybe there's something I can do as I'm edging the paths that I can try to get some kind of running water effect. Just because where this garden sits on our property, it, um, it's next to my neighbors, both my neighbors, because my house is a corner and there's one house on either side a vegetable garden and they have dogs and they sometimes hang out back there and we can you know I can hear them talking and then my neighbor on the other side of the fence has a fire pit and entertains a lot in the summer so it's not that having neighbors I mean I live in a city it doesn't ruin the vibe for me but I do like the idea of having some running water uh, to kind of you know just add to the atmosphere we also, I, I'm also looking for a way to incorporate a, a fire pit type of element um, because you'll see, I don't think we're gonna need this as a dining area, which was how it was originally intended. Oh, let's hold, Tim's calling. Okay, brief interlude to discuss the time of dinner with my husband. Uh, okay, at some point I gotta build some steps in this in this place so I was saving general it would seem there's just not a lot of parterre gardens in the United States it is decidedly a European thing in my opinion uh, gotta love the rusted steel uh, I like I said I have a ton of this uh, I am probably going to have to make stairs with my court and steel so we'll get into some of that with the layout, but let's do a few Googles for parterre. Let's 
slim pickings out there. How to design one. That could be helpful. Whoa, that's too busy for me. I mean, this is beautiful. I, I just, I, I can't get behind the little hedges. I understand why everyone likes them. Um, you know, if you watch Gardner's World, Monty's putting in you instead of his box because he got blight. But yeah, it's just, it just says I fuss with my garden and I do understand that some people, I mean, I fuss with my garden. It just is less obvious. So, you know, it's, it's just a lot for me. And if I couldn't make each of the spheres perfectly balanced, it would drive me bonkers. So that when you leave things natural, it's easier to achieve visual balance in my opinion. Uh, okay, Buxus, yes. Yeah. Topiary, m mini topiary. I'm still not getting like a lot of, okay, so here's something that's helpful. They're used to, they're supposed to be level. And this is what is very challenging about my space is that it has a, a significant grade change currently because the land has eroded over the years because there's only one small section of a retaining wall. Where should you position it? I get it. Wherever you position your garden, you should try to make sure that you're designing a garden for the sun conditions that you have. This is probably the closest area of my garden I have that's going to, be, you can tell I haven't made videos in a while, <clears throat> losing my voice. Um, it's like they could sense I was leaving. Very hard, very hard. Whoa. Okay. So, um, all right. So here's, here's a few ideas. You know, these are complex. I always wonder when the, when you have something like this, where there's no access to the center, do you just walk over it, step over it? I don't know. It's just all very symmetrical and I am just not a huge symmetry fan. So it's challenging for me. Small part here. Okay, we have that one. Uh, I guess we would need to see more to understand if it is a part here. All right, so this is some materials that I have. I have bluestone for my walkway. I likely cannot afford to do bluestone for my paths in this case. Um, and at one point we were considering covering the back porch, which is cement, um, concrete, uh, with bluestone. And I just don't know if that's in the budget. Things have just gotten so much more expensive since I started renovating the garden five years ago. Okay. I mean, you know, this goes back, I have a video on the history of potagers and it goes back to this concept of um, uh, them being for, for royals or nobility or things like that and, and looking down on the garden which, you know, 
we don't have a lot of nobility left these days and the billionaires are all building bunkers underground, not gardens to look down on. So, you know, hard to find a lot of examples. Yeah, it's, it's like this video is an exercise in reminding me that I do not, do not want to uh, have a bunch of boxwoods or hedges to clip. At least not in this garden. Maybe someday I'll mature into having an area with some more formality. Maybe when I'm 70, since I'm in my late 40s. I don't know. At that point, I hope I can afford to pay somebody to help me with all the gardening. Yeah, I think as I look through this, I definitely, we, we've established that the hedges are not for me. I think it's more my concern that by creating such a formal layout, I'm worried that I will find it visually boring if I cannot plant variety amongst the roses. So uh, while we are here, let's see, let's see. Okay. So these are some trees and shrubs that I have identified. Um, I ever since I think a couple of YouTubers, I know Aaron from Impatient Gardener got columnar apple trees, um, maybe sent to her or something to try and she tried them in pots. I started researching them and you know, you really have to buy fruit trees early, early with um, ever since the pandemic, I think, um, you know, growing your own everything is so trendy that it's sometimes really hard to find things if you need dwarf or specialty types of plants. So I did get six columnar apples in six different varieties. Uh, and they came in and three are quite large and three are quite small. So um, almost all of the fruit trees are just single liters at this point. They are all potted up in like a good mix of compost, blended soil, worm castings, and um, premium organic mechanic potting mix. But I do think there's a possibility that they're going to need to be grown on for potentially longer than a year in the pots, which means I may have to build the garden and put the pots in place instead of the trees because again some of them are so teeny tiny that I don't want them to be swallowed up by roses or something like that. Um, I have beach plum. This is actually beach plum fruit, beach plum shrub. I've had one of these. It doesn't fruit because it's pollinator friend. It needs pear. Uh, it died. And so it never fruits, but it's pretty. So I, I got another one to replace the one that died. And um, yeah, and then these Nutka cypress or spruces or these kind of pendulous evergreens. Uh, I have one outside my office that that space has tried three different trees and shrubs now. We finally found one that wants to live there. So um, I know that they're they're okay in my soil and in my climate so i am thinking of using them as a kind of backdrop screening in a multiple i haven't found them yet and again evergreens are something that you either need to get in spring before they all sell out or you may have a shot at finding them a second shipment arriving in the fall uh, they just, I've planted some in the warmer months and it's not necessarily great for them. So I think a lot of my losses early on with some of my evergreens had to do with the planting conditions. So, um, and then uh, I don't eat a ton of cherries. Um, my neighbor has a uh, sour variety. Uh, I know because some of them hang over my fence and I've picked them and eaten them. Um, but it, and it seems theirs is definitely self pollinating cause it fruits like crazy, but I researched some varieties that I think it could be based on the time it fruits and blooms. And I got a sweet cherry because that's my preference. I'm not going to bake, I don't bake cherry pies or anything or make jam. So I want some eating sweet cherries. So I got one that I think should play well with the neighbor's tree and they can possibly fruit better because they have cross-pollinating. 
um, and the other trees, uh, the six columnar apples are all pollinator pairings. Uh, same for the nectocot, and I think I got an apricot, and the two. I have two peach trees that are pollinator pairs. So that's one thing. Um, maybe we'll do a separate video on the fruit trees. Uh, it doesn't need to be too long, but I don't love buying from big, big plant websites, but I do find that it's a little easier to find the dwarf trees on them. And uh, early in the season, meaning like January, um, you can often find deals for buying pollinator pairs pairings, not pear trees, though you can probably find pairs of pears. But um, so yeah, uh, you know, you just want to make sure you're finding trees that either are self pollinating if you can only buy one or finding ones with uh, compatible pollinators like blueberries. My blueberry adventure required, you know, some trial and error to get ones that I have early, mid, and late, but I have to make sure that they can pollinate everybody. So uh, anyway, all right, so, so I think our next video is going to be drawing because, no, it's not like I can't change the list around, but I did use the drone to introduce you guys to this project, and I can use the drone images to update my sketches to make sure that I'm still in scale uh, can be a little challenging when you work on drawings for the longest time to make sure everything still fits. And even then, things change. Um, you know, the Potager Garden turned out pretty much just like the drawings, but some of the measurements were off or cheated around or, you know, tree stumps and things like that moved things around. So it's important that I update the drawings to kind of consider scale and think a little bit about how big some of the trees need to grow to so that they can be happy in their home because they are kind of lining the fences. And you know, if they're tiny, they may not catch the sun that they need to grow. So, so that will be the next thing that we're doing. And then we will look at all the iterations and all the previous ideas that have existed for this space, which is possibly why it's taken so long to get to a place where it, it needed. Uh, well, I hope you guys enjoyed, um, you know, seeing some of the roses arrive, seeing the different roses that are already here. There's about 10 or 12 um, in the growing stages. And uh, next up, we will be doing some on-screen drawing, likely in the same format where you can see me, but I'll plug the iPad into the screen so you can kind of watch me draw and look through. There's got to be 35 different drawings in my Procreate app of this space, if not more. They're probably all labeled the same thing, so I'll have to do a little pre-work and make sure they're labeled. But um, thank you guys so much for joining me on this journey to create a rose orchard garden. I'm still plugging away at the vases. I actually am about to take uh, this guy. This probably looks gigantic. Let me check the screen. Yeah. It's a little oversized. It's obviously a footed bowl, or I guess it looks a little bit like a duck. But this is a prototype that I'm trying in a bowl collection, and I'm going to put a pin frog in it and cut some tulips, and I have some leftover stuff from the wedding, and see what I can make in it. Yeah, but stay tuned. There will be some floral designing coming up and some scenes from around the garden. And a lot of people ask for specific flower collection tours. I think that might be a little challenging. So what I am going to try to do because I walk the garden at least twice a day just for a break or to just go look at something pretty. What I will try to do is I'll just record everything like I do in the scenes from around the garden and we'll try to edit them into a, you know, an overview. I have always wanted to have like an, a video of the entire peony season. I think everybody would really like to see a video of the entire iris season. And then um, ultimately I think the roses and, but 
I think Iris is um, one that a lot of people have commented on in the past and I will be continuing to divide them this year and I just um, ran into one of my former students and freelancers and she is now growing as a Philly flower farmer and um, so I think there's a network of flower farmers that I'm going to try to, you know, get them to take my extra rhizomes when I divide my iris so that they can grow them and they, be they can become more widely available as cut flower in the area because they are hard to find as a cut flower and they are so magical in arrangements. I really cannot wait to take the twist vase. This is the 3D model, the printed plastic one, but um, the porcelain ones should be here before iris season really kicks off. And um, I'm very excited to fill that vase with a handful of iris stems and just let them do their thing. Same with tulips. It's turning out to be a very interesting vase to design in. And um, hopefully, again, like I said, they will be available for sale in the next few months. They are in production, so at some point I will be able to sell them. <laughs> Just, I'm struggling right now to find boxes to pack them in to ship them safely to people who order them. So I'll end redoing the website so actually you can buy them. Since for 15 years my website really has only had to show photos of the things that I do. So, uh, boy, I can't wait to edit all of this. Thank you guys so much for watching, catching up with me, looking at the roses and looking at some inspiration and I will see you soon for some drawing. Bye.